Well, good afternoon. It's very nice to be here. Um, when I was asked to come and talk to you, I thought, that's rather strange. It's not the sort of audience I would normally be talking to. And, um, but I, I'm rather glad I am here because some of your products have helped me over the years. Um, I want to share with you some thoughts on adaptability that were shared with me very early in my life. Um, imagine, if you will, that the world is in chaos. Your world is turned upside down. And uh, you are faced with the problem that your family are thousands of miles away. And between you and your family, you see this. Dense, tropical rainforest. Ask yourself a question. What do you see? Do you see a threat or an opportunity? When I look at the rainforest, I see home. I see food, shelter, the possibility for an adventure. However, in the Second World War, when Singapore fell to the rapid advance of the Japanese army, the rainforest was itself used as the barbed wire to imprison our army. Our soldiers were marched into captivity, a living hell. They were told that if you try to escape, you will be executed. But there is no point in trying to escape because you'll never get through the rainforest. At that time, our soldiers had no survival training as we would have today. How did they survive? And that's something that really interested me. And I've spent a lot of time talking to veterans who survived the Burma Railroad. The nightmare of that experience is difficult to describe. And I'm, I've chosen only to bring a few images here to show you. Um, a few weeks ago, I was talking to the British Defence Survival School, people I work with on a regular basis, and I gave them the full horrors of life in the camp. But I think that would probably spoil your lunch if I showed you. But um, these sketches uh, give you some idea of the energy that's involved in them. The photograph on the bottom right there was taken in the worst camp on the Burma Railroad. And uh, in fact, they had a man who had a camera. He'd smuggled a camera in, took four frames, and then realized it was too dangerous to take any more. He took the camera apart and threw it into a latrine. Um, the man on the top left was one of the most interesting people I have ever met, the most interesting man I've ever interviewed. His name was Jim Bradley, and he escaped from the Burma Railroad. And I want to share with you two thoughts from this time to start my talk. The first is that how do you survive in these camps? Well, history is what it was. I met one survivor. In fact, he was a relative um, of a hut. And he told me that the problem was malnutrition. This was the worst thing. The men were being worked to death and being fed very little Food. There was no protein in the food they had, and so when they got sick, their bodies couldn't repair themselves. He and a colleague decided that they would add worms to the meagre rations that they were given. And they, they collected worms one day, and they, they learned that if they put them into some salt water and massaged them till they were pure pink, they could put them into the broth that they were given to live off of, and they felt better for it. And they shared this knowledge with the other men in the hut that they were imprisoned in. The other men decided that they didn't want to debase themselves by eating worms. The only two men to survive from that hut were those who ate worms. They adapted to the circumstance. They survived. They lived. Choosing to adapt is the first step in the process of adaption. Jim Bradley, well, his story is amazing. He 
was an officer and he made some preparations in the early chaos of the fall of Singapore to enable him to escape. Was sent to the same camp as you see there. And um, I won't go into all the gory details, but after uh, a number of weeks, his colonel came to him and said, Jim, I want you to lead a party, an escape party, to take word out to the world of what is going on here. Ten men went into the jungle. Eight weeks later, five men staggered out of the jungle. Remember, they had no survival training. They should have been very comfortable in there with a very small amount of information. They staggered out of the jungle onto a river. They made a raft. The raft broke apart in some rapids. They were washed up on a sandbar. And lo and behold, local people came along and picked them up, took them back to a kampong, a village. And they were sat down and given a good meal of rice and some fish. They were very, very happy. And as they were eating the meal, a lorry turned up. And it was the Imperial Japanese Army. They'd been sold back to their enemy. Because Jim was the officer, he was taken back down the railroad, and he had several stops on the way back. At each occasion, he was told he was going to be burned to death. He wasn't burned to death. He was sent back to Singapore, where he was handed over to the secret police, the Kempitai, who tortured him. They were going to put him on trial and execute him, but a British officer who could speak fluent Japanese explained, you cannot execute him under the code of Bushido, because he has conquered the jungle, and you should respect him for that. So he wasn't executed but he was tortured. Close to death, he was sent to Changi Prison. When he recovered in Changi Prison, he was taken back to Outram Road, which is where the Kempitai headquarters were, and he was tortured again. Once again, he nearly died, and he went back to Changi, itself a hellhole. And word found its way on the jungle ter telegraph into all of the prisons in Singapore and on the Burma Railroad that there was a British officer being tortured every day who wouldn't give in. They sent him back to the Kempitai. And one day, he looked out of his cell door and realized there were no guards, because they'd all left. For him, the war was over. When he came out, he staggered out. He uh, managed to find his way back to Britain in two days, which is astonishing. And that was because everybody had heard about this man resisting. How did he cope? How could he adapt with those circumstances? I asked him this question, and he said to me, I adapted inside my head. My enemy could not control my thoughts, and in my thoughts I found freedom. He is the most profound example of adaptability that I have ever encountered. He could turn his mind to more pleasant things. And what kept him alive was the thought of returning to see his wife and his daughter, which he did. These stories and others um, inspired me as a boy to take an interest um, in the outdoors. And some 30-odd years ago, I started a company to teach uh, traditional skills. Survival is a shorthand of a much older and bigger subject I call bushcraft. It's the, deep, the longhand of the subject and of tracking skills. And I built the company on one basic premise. We will never bullshit. We will live what we teach. We will do it for real. There's a lot of bullshit. You'll see a lot on television, you see people who kind of Cro-Magnon approach to survival. Mine isn't. Mine is the scientific approach. Let's really understand how things are done. I've been able in my lifetime to travel literally to every corner of our planet and uh, explore remote wild areas. That's where I'm most at home. I've learned to be at home in an incredible range of different terrains and climates. Only a few photographs, but to give you some idea of the sort of places I, I call home. I've had to adapt to a whole range of different foods, food types and learn to enjoy things that otherwise might be unacceptable. I've also had to adapt to different cultures around the planet. That's one of the greatest joys of my work, has been to learn from the real experts, the uh, native inhabitants of many parts of the planet who still live a traditional lifestyle. These are just some of my friends. These are men I track with. Um, in Namibia on, uh, uh, currently, and uh, that's, that's really interesting when you learn from other cultures and you start to see the world through their eyes. I've taught survival um, in every climate on the planet, and I spent 10 years teaching British Special Forces how to stay alive in remote places. 
I've also been able to make television programs about my interests. For over 20 years, I've been making television programs. In fact, I said to a, a television colleague that I was coming to give a talk on adaptability. And she laughed. She said, they picked the right person. You're the most adaptable person I know. Just tell them you've spent 20 years working in television. So I have had a pretty unique life, very unusual when I look back on it. I've been very lucky. Um, but I have had to adapt, and uh, I thought long and hard about that, and I realized that adaptability is actually one of the key traits in my work. And um, I want to discuss with you whether it can be learned, whether it can be taught. And I thought I'd start by trying to explain how I learned. And uh, that has been really interesting. I'd like to thank you for inviting me here because you've made me sit down and think about something I do just by a natural process and try to understand it a little better. For me, I think adaptability started um, at school. I had a very old-fashioned British education. You may not believe it, but it's quite true that when I went to school, we had inkwells in our desks that had ink in them. We had nib pens. And if you used a ballpoint pen, you could be caned. Strangely enough, the headmaster and the other teachers all did their marking with ballpoint pens. That was the first lesson of life. If you're going to teach something, you should also do it yourself. And that's something I firmly believe. When I was nine, I think it is, I was trying to work it out, it must have been nine, I was uh, playing in a little courtyard which we, we had where we used to kick a tennis ball against the wall, as kids do. And... Um, these ball games were very popular. I must tell you, one morning in school assembly, the headmaster made a very important announcement on the stage. It was a very old-fashioned school, and he said this, Will the seniors please stop playing with the juniors' balls? <laughs> you can't beat that, can you? Anyway. But anyway, I was, we were kicking the ball against the wall, and we had a rule. That if you managed to kick it up onto the roof, which was above this wall, you had to go and get it. And at nine, with great enthusiasm, I kicked this tennis ball, and it didn't go forwards, it went upwards. It went straight up onto the roof of the building. So this was my first situation in life that I have to solve and fix. And I say solve because adaptability is about challenge. And uh, in the corner where the wall was, there was a drain pipe, and I got hold of the drain pipe, and I'd never climbed a drain pipe before. Up I went, and I got onto the roof, I got the ball, and I threw it down triumphant. And I turned round to climb back down the drain pipe. But at the top of the drain pipe, there was a, it was fed into by another one. There was this funnel-like shape. And as I slipped, my arm went down into the funnel. And I was left dangling 30 feet above the ground by my elbow. And at that moment, the bell rang. That wasn't an electric bell. It was one of those hand ones, you know. Which meant the end of break time and the beginning of lessons. And everybody left. So much for teamwork. <laughs> Leaving me hang, hanging 30 feet above the ground. Well, that was a really important moment for me. It was a life-defining moment. Because I decided in those moments that I was not going to get in trouble for climbing up onto the roof. And I was, wasn't going to have the humility of being rescued. I decided to solve the problem for myself. And that's really interesting. Problem solving. How do you solve a problem? Well... I thought about it. I didn't panic. I think that's really important. I thought about the problem, and I realized that if I jammed my toes hard enough behind the drain pipe, I might be able to gain a purchase again and get some lift. If I got some lift, I could get the other hand up, and so on. But I thought beyond that. This is what interests me. I realized that my next lesson was in a classroom which had a window that opened out onto the flat roof where the ball had been. So, in fact, what I could do is I could go up the drain pipe onto the roof and hopefully, if the window was open, climb in through the window and join my lesson. There was a risk involved. And that's what I did. I managed to get up onto the roof and I climbed in through the window just before the teacher entered the room. And that was important too. Why was that important? Because I'd succeeded. I'd taken a risk and I'd succeeded. And it's one of the things I absolutely believe in when I teach any skill today is that success builds success. That's really important. So I, got out, I didn't get caught and did pretty well. Now, this school was an amazing school in one regard.
they decided that we should all do judo. Judo was a compulsory lesson. It was not a sport. And um, this was a very important part of my education. I can't begin to tell you how much so. In fact, what I would say is if you've never done judo and you are learning to adapt, then you should go to a judo dojo and enroll tomorrow. Judo is all about adapting. I was very, very lucky. The man who taught judo at this school, his name was Kingsley Hopkins, had been taught by this man here, Gunji Koizumi. And Mr. Koizumi had been taught by another man, Jigoro Kano, who started judo. So I was learning judo third hand from the man who started it. It was taught not as an Olympic sport, but as a martial art. And in judo, you learn many things. You learn strength, and discipline, spirit. You learn detailed techniques, which you then must adapt to different opponents. Short, fat opponents, tall, skinny opponents, very strong opponents, all sizes. You have to learn to adapt. You must look for opportunities to exploit. And you must also keep an awareness of everything else that's going on around you. It trains you to think in an adaptable way. I think that's really important. I'll come back to that. Judo became a very big part of my life for many years. And uh, I remember many, some years later, I, managed, I went to a club eventually in London, which was the oldest club outside of Japan. And there we had the luxury of many world champions coming to teach. Uh, we had two very, very well-known Japanese world champions who taught there for two years. One of these men was a wonderful judo, probably the greatest judo player of all time. His, his name is Yamashita, and he was teaching. And the great thing about judo, it's not like other sports. You can't imagine going on to the tennis court and trying to have a game with Federer if you're not a world champion. But in judo, you can go onto the mat and be thrown by the world's top players. And I found myself paired as a young man in my 20s against Yamashita. And he was attacking and trying out a, 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 one of the first techniques you learn in judo, a throw called Tayatoshi, the body drop. But just by fluke, being very young and at that time incredibly fit and very flexible, I was able to leap over his attack in a very European way. So every time he made his attack, I leapt over it. And I think he became irritated and a little dogmatic, which is not like him at all. And he kept attacking and attacking and attacking. And after about 20 attacks, I realized that if I was just a little bit quicker, see, I see an opportunity, maybe I could throw my leg through and throw him. And do you know what? I did. He came down like a redwood falling in the Californian forests. And I stood up with a smile that went round my back and my head and came back and went back and went back. And then he picked me up and he fed me through every crack in the mats. It was quite a salutary lesson. He was definitely the master. However, the point I want to make is in judo we adapt, we must not be dogmatic, and we must look for opportunities to exploit. This is adaptability. This is how to succeed through adapting. After I left school, I went into the city for a while and I found that I didn't enjoy working in offices. And uh, I then found my way into the world of expeditions. And back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, there were a lot of expeditions going off around the world. It was a great time, a time of great improvisation. In 1990, I was asked to rescue uh, the expedition of a young lady who was walking around the world. And her expedition had come to a temporary halt in the middle of Africa in Zaire, when Zaire fell apart and the army rebelled because the president of the time, Mobutu, had not paid the army. And three weeks after she found herself back in Britain, she asked me, would you come back and walk with me and we'll start in the country nearest to Zaire in, in Central African Republic and we will walk. You, you've seen this film, Wild, yeah? Where she, the lady in that film walked a thousand miles. Well, this journey was only the African leg of a journey that went around the world and that would be 8,000 miles. That actually turned out for her to be 15,000 miles. This is a young woman called Fiona Campbell. Anyway, 
I went back with her to Central African Republic, not knowing what I would step into. And uh, we arrived. Uh, the heat was too heavy, too hot to, to, to even contemplate walking any speed with big heavy rucksacks. And I noticed the local people all had handcarts, so we bought a handcart. And we got deposited at a town called Bangasu on the border of Zaire and uh, Central Afri African Republic, the nearest point north. And we began walking with all our possessions on a handcart. And we walked like that for 10 days and covered 300 miles. Pretty difficult. Living in a part of Africa in the bush where when two fair-haired white people were encountered by the local people, they would shout mamiwata, drop their possessions, including their shoes if they were flip-flops, and run and hide in the woods because they thought we were mermaids come to spirit them away. It was a fascinating time. You never knew what you were going to walk into. There were a lot of problems, and you had to solve it. We had no backup. Failure was not an option. Failure was not an option, and that's a principle I've tried to cling to ever since. When you're young, you do crazy things. You know, you're naive and foolish. You find yourself into situations. So I've clung to this concept of failure is not an option. It was a fascinating expedition. I could tell you, I could keep you entertained with many stories from that time. But the net result of that trip, um, apart from a, a developing a, a very uh, a lifelong uh, enjoyment of Maggie cubes and uh, Nido milk powder, um, was that it taught me that whatever's around the corner, you can deal with it if you take the right attitude to it. I came out of Zaire weighing. I don't know what it is in pounds. It was 14 pounds is one stone. I went in at 13 stone. I was very fit. I came out at eight stone. I'd had malaria twice. Uh, it was quite a, a, an adventure. It's interesting how you adapt. We learned how to talk to local officials who were corrupt and, uh, and also how to play the crowd. We had crowds would gather around you and you suddenly you start to realise that the local officials who are giving you a hassle have also hassled the local people. And if you could say the right things, you could win their support. So when eventually we came, it's a long story, we had a vehicle we rescued from Zaire. When we came to leave Zaire and go into Central African public, we didn't have the paperwork necessary to come out with that vehicle. We managed to come out because the immigration officials on the border, uh, we'd met them unwittingly three days before and been very polite to them, and they liked us. And because when the really corrupt man there in the customs room tried to search the vehicle for things to steal, we said very loudly, I'm sorry, we have no toys to give. We've given them all away to the children. And the crowd laughed. So you, you adapt because you have to. It's much easier in some ways to adapt when you have to, when your life depends upon it than when it's just work. So you must try, I think, when you're working, and I try to impart this to my team, is that when they're working and it's just business, to try and think that their life depends upon the decisions they make. It makes it easier. Challenge is what, adapt what drives adaptability. And prepare as you may, there will come the moment when you have to deal with the unexpected. And um, that happened for me uh, very dramatically here in America in 2005. At the time, I was working on um, a documentary program about Jim Bridger, the mountain man. And we were filming in Wyoming, and uh, we were doing some helicopter filming of the old wagon ruts which, of course, start here in St. Louis. But anyway, we, there we were in Wyoming following the wagon ruts in a helicopter. Very windy day, but we had a very good helicopter pilot. He told us he'd done three tours in Vietnam. It subsequently turns out that he'd done three tours in Vietnam as ground crew. And uh, I'd got up in the helicopter to take some still photographs, and um, we're flying downwind, making a fast turn into the wind, when I looked out of the window and I thought, crikey, we're very low. And I looked again and I thought, we're going to hit. And as I thought that, the alarms went off in the helicopter. You get this, doo -doo 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 -doo. And it felt as though the helicopter was trying to claw at the sky. Now, you may hear that people say that in an accident, time slows down. 
Let me tell you, when you're in a helicopter crash, it doesn't feel like that at all. The energy in a helicopter when the, band, when the rubber band breaks is astonishing. Put yourself in a washing machine and put it on spin cycle and then throw it off the back of a truck. That's how it feels. A witness who witnessed the crash said, we came down on the tail rotor. The tail rotor hit the ground, broke off. That upended the helicopter. It went forwards. The rotor struck twice, and then it somersaulted, impacting three times before it skid to a halt. During this, the fuel came out of the back of the helicopter and then was then blown onto us. From my point of view, inside the helicopter, the world went mad. I went into the brace position, just as you learn on the aircraft. I know, because I'm a survival instructor, these things have meaning. You put your feet on the ground and push them back against the seat so you don't get whiplash that breaks your legs. You cover your head to protect yourself from things falling on you. I also, when I fly, fly like the military with long sleeves and gloves on. And this is how I was flying that day. When we first impacted, I thought, this isn't good. At the moment, which would have been the first somersault, I thought, I'm going to die. I thought, so be it. I've had a good life. Yeah, I have. I've filled my life. I think that's really important. But, uh, but I also did something that my old judo instructor told me, and that is, if you're in a crash, relax. So strange as it may seem, I tried as best I could to relax because your body much better absorbs the shocks. When the helicopter uh, finished its crashing, there was this sound of gravel as we slid along the, the shale there. And then I remember very clearly the fuel landing on us. In fact, it was just a cloud of vapor. And if it had caught fire, I wouldn't be talking to you now because we would have burned probably from the inside out. All of us had fuel deep inside us afterwards. At that moment, I felt movement beside me. I thought, crikey, I'm alive. I don't know if I'm injured, but I'm sure everybody else must be dead. And I then felt cameraman who I'd worked with for 15 years beside me moving, which was great. Um, but I was covered in fuel, fuel in my eyes. The leather gloves I had were wonderful, brilliant pair of American gloves. You have the best gloves in the world. And I took these, these buckskin gloves, and I did that. And the fuel immediately took the fuel out of my eyes. And I saw a light beside me, and I crawled out. And this is what I crawled out of. That's what's left of a Bell Jet Ranger after such a crash. I was on the underside of uh, the aircraft as I came out. As I came out, I'm, of course, thinking it might catch fire, I heard my cameraman say, I'm alive, but my legs are broken. He was six foot two. He was a big man. I turned around to go and get him, and he was trying to clamber out of the wreckage where the passenger seat is on the side. And uh, I braced myself for the thought of how heavy he would be. There was so much adrenaline pumping. He weighed nothing. He felt like a feather. I couldn't get him out. He had a harness on. I remember I had a knife in my pocket. I cut the strap took him out. And at that point, like a miracle, the pilot uh, became beside my side and also a director who'd been in the helicopter. We'd all survived the crash. But my cameraman was rather badly broken. His right leg uh, was broken in the shin. It was at a right angle. His left foot showed massive deformity of all the broken bones inside here. Um, and uh, I found myself now having come out of the helicopter being the one having now to take responsibility for dealing with the problems. One of the things I can tell you, because I know myself very well, is that, and it annoys people, but when there's a crisis, I know what needs doing. I can't tell you why, maybe it's the judo. But when there's a crisis and everyone else is going, I will be stepping forward to deal with it. I see the solutions. The solutions just come to me. And that was exactly the case on that day. I looked at the situation, I realized what was going on, and I started to make a plan, things I'm going to talk about in a minute. I prioritized what needed doing. I, I knew from my training what to do in terms of first aid. Training is very important. It needs to be thorough, it needs to be realistic. You need to rehearse as realistically as you can whatever you're preparing for, so that when the moment comes, you go into autopilot, which I did. I looked at the energy involved in the helicopter crash. I looked at my broken cameraman beside me, and I realized he could have more serious injuries. 
At about that moment, our ground crew who, who were with us turned up in shock. In fact, the most psychologically affected member of the team was the sound recordist who, for 15 years, you'll understand, has been tethered by a lead, like an umbilical cord to that cameraman, saw all of us standing up except his buddy and was very badly traumatised by that event. Uh, I asked them to call. I had a GPS. I got a GPS out. I got a coordinates of where we were. I asked um, the, one of our researchers to call for help, to call 911. This is where we are. Give them these coordinates. I don't think they trusted an English accent. We were in Wyoming. And I went over and, it, and I took the phone and I said, who am I talking to? And it was a 911 person. I'd love to hear the recording. It must be amusing. Because I said, I'm, this is the coordinates for the crash site. This, these are the injuries. We need an air ambulance. This is where... And then I made her read the numbers back to me. And then got back to the task in hand. The first aid kit we had was provided by the BBC. was next to useless. And uh, with some gaffer tape, great American invention, I suspect, and uh, a sleeping mat, we improvised a splint for my colleague's leg and uh, a windbreak from our camera cases. You can see I'm in a state of shock. Um, the man in the middle on the right, who was in the helicopter as well. And, uh, and there we were. And the first man to turn up was a policeman. And he took one look at what was going on and hadn't a clue what to do, so he took everybody's names and addresses. <laughs> then a fire engine turned up, but there was no fire, so they weren't very happy. And eventually, uh, the first aid turned up, and they were fantastic. And at that point, it was the hardest moment for me in the whole event, was handing over responsibility for the care of my colleague to them. Because at that moment, I became a casualty, if you like. Fortunately, I only had a bruise on my leg. So I break helicopters if they crash around me. But it was really interesting that all of that training that I provided to others in terms of how to cope with a crisis, all of a sudden, I'm the one walking the talk. I'm very glad that I was able to on that day. In my team, I go to great lengths to teach the people who work for me how to adapt. Adapting, adaptability and leadership are absolutely, inextricably linked. And I, I'm going to poison you now with, with PowerPoint for a few moments, if I may, to try and explain the process that I use to teach adaptability. I've never had to sit down and write it down before, so it's your own fault. Normally, this just happens organically. We teach by an apprenticeship scheme. If you want to train a dog sled team, you take the new dog and you put it alongside an old dog, and one teaches the other. I absolutely, firmly believe in that process. I don't like management situations where the bosses sit above everybody else and talk it but don't walk it. You have to work together. What's also interesting about that is that sometimes those of us who are getting a bit longer in the tooth gain some energy from the younger guys. That can also help us. So that's really important. It takes us five years to train somebody to teach at the basic level, to become a basic instructor. And um, of the most important part of their training is their attitude to the job. It's very, very important that we work on how they think. It's not what they think that's important, but how they think it. You heard earlier about inside and outside thinking. I really like that. We want people to think outside of the box. I don't like dogma, as I explained to you earlier. I like fresh thinking. Let's take a fresh view of this. When we're teaching, what is it we're going to teach? We make a syllabus, and then we step outside of the syllabus and say, right, there's our syllabus. Now, how are we going to teach it? So few people do that in education. It's very important that you walk the talk. Don't just say something. Do it. You teach more by doing. In fact, when we have people on courses and we're teaching them a skill, they'll learn the syllabus, but I can see who taught them when I meet them at a remote time because they've actually copied the mannerisms of their instructors. I call it learning by assimilation. It's the dog, old dog, new dog thing happening, but with students. So it's very important that you don't just talk it, but you do it. One of the things that I really enjoy about working with the military 
the thing that I like the most about the military is that it doesn't matter what age or rank the soldier is that I'm talking to, whether he's a young 20-year-old about to do a junior NCO's course, or whether it's a general, they are still expected to learn new things. This concept of lifelong learning is intrinsic to military thinking. In the civilian world, people get to 35 and they put themselves in an office, they put a nice sign on their desk or on their door, so I've arrived. Don't test me anymore, I'm here now. That's a rule. And they, they become protective, but in the same process, they are weakening themselves. You have to keep learning. And don't be afraid to go back over old ground, because as you become more experienced, you go back over the fundamentals and you perceive them differently. You see things you didn't see there the first time. So this concept of learning is really important. And then the other thing about attitude is we're guiding in the wilderness. The hardest lessons, if you like, the most important lessons come later on when I'm guiding in the wilderness. And the team members that come with me there, they learn something at that time, and I'd rather you don't share it with them until that time, is before we go into the bush, the first thing I say to them is, how many souls are we responsible for? It was an airline pilot who told me that. He said in his airline, they always had to say, how many souls do we have on board? Not people, souls. It, it was a term that emphasised that they had responsibility for the care and welfare of the people on the aircraft, just as we do in the wilderness. So this sense of what is your responsibility is really important, because responsibility coupled with pride, corporate pride, is very important to the values of your company and how successfully you achieve your aims. I work outdoors and it won't be any surprise to you that I try to prevent problems in the first instance. And I think that's true in business too. Quite often you can see a car crash coming. It's a matter of setting in process this, per this, this concept of let's, let's not get to the point well, we have a problem on our hands. Let's try and head it off at the pass. So preparation. I mean, you've, you've all seen the business posters. Proper preparation prevents poor performance. Failing to prepare is preparing to fail. We've all seen it, and it's true. Preparation is really important in whatever field or sphere you're working in. In mine, it's critical. And it comes down sometimes to tiny things, little nitty-gritty. I believe in developing my team in terms of their equipment and their training. Remember I said how important training was. We try to make the training as realistic as possible. When we're in the field, you won't be surprised that the team know how to canoe or to climb, to make fires. Well, all of that, that, that is taken as red. But also the office staff. If we have a problem in the field, our route of communication is through there. So they must be tested and incorporated in that training. We don't leave anything to chance. We will test them till they are at their wits end with difficulty so that they've been inoculated against panic and failure should the need arise. That is really important. And, it's, and it's, you, you, what happens when you train in that way is you identify weaknesses in your systems and your processes that you can address before the need arrives. I pass on the values of my company to my team constantly. I don't lecture them in, a, in, a, in an overt way. I just share it with them. It's the philosophy of the company. This is really important because if they understand the concepts of the company, they can independently make decisions for themselves when there's no one there to hold the hand. That, I think, is really important. Risk management is a legal requirement in Britain to carry out risk assessments for whatever you're doing, whether it's in the workplace or out in the wilderness, you should see our risk assessment for an expedition into the rainforest. It's fascinating. Many companies would not carry out the type of training that we do because they'd be so worried about the risk, certainly if they showed it to us a lawyer. Lawyers are at their own risk, if you ask me. Any here to that one must be. Hmm. But, but risk management is fundamental to what we do, and I don't just expect them to learn how to do the the corporate risk management on a computer with a piece of paper. I want them to be constantly assessing risk when we're in the field. We've planned to cross this, this river over this 
tree that's fallen down, but one of the parties looking a bit tired. They haven't eaten very well. They've been sick for two days. The risk strategy has to be adaptive, going on all the time. And you must look for the perfect storm. I can't stress that one enough. The perfect storm. I'm going to uh, run a course that I've run five times this year. It's very straightforward, very basic. Um, but we haven't got one of the normal assistants we have with us, uh, which would be better, ideal if they were. And, um, oh yeah, there's bad weather coming. That to me is the brewing of a perfect storm. Two or three things that of their own would not cause a problem, but in concert can create a problem. There, there are many circumstances in outdoor pursuiting when people see the perfect storm developing but fail to act. So my team are trained to look at the perfect storm. We, we keep a record of all past events that we can then use, and, and from other companies, let me tell you. We look at people all over the world. When there's a problem, when there's a mistake, we take it apart to see if there's anything we can learn from it and hand on. It becomes part of our ethos. A few minutes before I took this photograph, that bear was standing beside me. It's in British Columbia. It was this close. It was quite a shock. I'd, gone, I'd been living on a yacht, guiding people to take photographs and learn about grizzly bears. And as it is on a yacht, you have a lot of cardboard boxes that clutter up your life. And we needed to burn the empty ones. So we'd gone onto, onto shore in a little, little river on a sandbar. I started to burn these boxes. A client beside me. I heard this noise beside me and turn around, and this bear has stepped into the river beside me. He's the opposition. Well, I'm here. I'm not hurt. He didn't come to any harm either, because before the trip, I had taken the time to really know the dangers, really know my opponents, my competition. You heard that earlier, too. Again, this is reinforcing things here. You have to know your enemies. You have to think like them. See the world from their perspective. That's very important. Get into the mind of the thing that could be your opponent. And then there's one danger, and that is that you start to... You say, I'm going to think like the grizzly bear. But you then start to think like a human and confuse yourself. It's very, very important. There was a guy who died some years ago who thought that he could think like a bear, but actually was thinking like a human thinking like a bear. And he ended up being eaten. So this is very important. You must be honest, but think like your opponents. Know your adversaries. What happens when something goes wrong? When something goes wrong. The most important thing, in my experience, when something goes wrong, is that you maintain your focus and your momentum. It's the hardest thing of all, is to achieve momentum. And um, I have somebody who works for me, who will say to me when I go into the office, probably when I get back from here, she'll say, there was a problem. This is what I've done about it. I love that. Those are the words I want to hear. And it may not be the perfect solution, but we've moved on. There's a solution. We've adapted in some way, and we've maintained momentum. That's really important. So look when you're building a team for people who solve problems automatically. It's not such a common thing. Now, very often you can be working in a team and find that the person next to you saw the problem but decided not to do anything about it. So, the last kind of thoughts here. You're, you're assessing threats and opportunities. You prioritise your tasks and you think laterally. I think I've kind of covered those in the things I've been saying to you already. Threats and opportunities. So, you decide that you need to adapt in some way, in a business sense, or for me, outdoors. I'm going to make a plan. And when I've made the plan, I always keep in, in mind this phrase, kiss, murder, and manage the risk. Kiss. It's mnemonic. Keep it simple, stupid. So often I see people have problems when they make a complicated plan. The simpler you make the plan, the better. Simplify, simplify, simplify. It's much easier to communicate a simple idea than a complex one. Murder. You've got your plan. Okay. Now, I came in earlier this morning and I heard a senior man saying, proactive, yeah, lots of energy, you must do that. That's great. 
don't like cynicism. I like cynics. I want the cynic to murder my plan. I put my plan up on the wall. This is what I think we're going to do. And I've tried to think of all the contingencies that we have to think about. Look to your cynic. Find the holes in our plan. Pull it apart. That's the what if. What if this happens? Have you thought about that? You want someone to take your plan apart. Find the weaknesses. And once you've found them, you manage the risks. You reassess that plan. It's so important. And it's so often forgotten. The number of times people fail because they come up with this great plan, but they don't really pull it apart before they apply it. History is full of those circumstances. The other thing is you have to be able to build teams. When that helicopter crash occurred, I built a team from the people around me. I needed someone to record the the data that I was finding out about the injuries. I needed someone to call for, a heli for, for help. Make a team around you. Build small teams. Be flexible. And what is your smallest team? Two people? Four people? Eight? In my world, the smallest component of a team is one. Because I often make solo trips. When I make a solo trip, I am responsible for all the decision making. I am responsible for all the successes or failures. And that's how we think. So all of our instructors are trained to work as individuals to care for themselves in the bush and be totally reliable as an individual. And then you put a team together of people of that, built, of that ilk, you end up with a very strong team. Do you remember that story? You take a, a stick, you can snap it. You take a bundle of sticks, you can't snap it. But what if you made that bundle out of sticks that each of them was so flexible they wouldn't break anyway? That's what we're looking for. The super team, made of strong individuals. It's very exciting. Now, today we send quick messages by tweeting. Back in the 1800s, if you were a naval commander, you were tweeting too because you had a very limited means of communication. You had to put flags up the mast. And in 1805, the commander of the French and Spanish fleet put up these flags. This was his message to his are his soldiers before they went into battle. If you're not engaged, you're not at your post. It's a terrible message. It suggests that he doesn't trust them, that he will have to discipline them if they don't do what he wants. It's an appalling message. He, of course, lost. He lost because he was up against one of the finest and most adaptable military commanders of the age, Admiral Horatio Nelson. His message is somewhat different. He was a master of communication. It's a very famous message of your British. England expects every man to do his duty. It's really interesting. I think it's fascinating. It says, we're in this together. I'm one of you. I'm one of the team. We're all together. And the key thing is expects. When you, if you're leading a team, if you're managing a team, if you're a team member, you need to know two things. You need to know the plan, definitely. But more important sometimes than that is the expectations of your boss. You need to know what their expectations are so that if things go off the game plan, you have some guide as to what to do. So if you're the manager, you say, this is the plan, but let me tell you, above all and everything else, this is what I expect of you. If you haven't been told that by your boss because you're a team of one, so you have to think like a leader too, you ask, what do you expect of me if things don't go according to plan? It's very, very important. Every man in that Navy knew what was expected of him. It's a very simple thing. Another great military leader we can learn from, Rommel. A credible man. He did several astonishing things. I don't know whether you're aware, but in the First World War, he captured an Italian town with five soldiers. He swam across a river and he sniped at the Italian troops in this town through the night. And in the morning, he marched into the town and he says, you're surrounded, surrender. And they did. Because they didn't know any different. He would kept moving his men. He saw an opportunity and he took the initiative. He became so good at this that in combat, if he saw an opportunity to push through the enemy lines and come around behind them, he would do it. And 
it so take people by surprise that they felt he must have overwhelming odds and thereby capitulate. He was a master of that. He wasn't good at everything, but that's one thing he was very good at. There's two other things I really like about him. It goes back to something that you said earlier, and that is he went to the front line to see for himself what is going on. Don't rely on other people to tell you what's happening. They might tell you what they think you want to hear. Go and see for yourself. You get a much better feel for what's happening at the front line. At the shop front, whatever it is. We all have our own front lines. And then the other thing he would do, he'd go back to the front line when the plan was engaged to make sure that his message and his expectations were being delivered to the men at the front line. Because sometimes the middle managers middle-ranking officers, would modify his orders. So he'd go right to the front and say, no, that's not what I want. This is what I want. You heard it from me. I'm the general. He's a captain. And that was very, very effective. And what you do in that process, you take away any uncertainty in the mind of the person at the front end. And that's really important. This is, this is when you see an army that's being adaptable. Yeah. Now, I don't want to leave North America out when I talk about military commanders. And my greatest hero was a commander who fought in the French and Indian War in New Hampshire against the French and Indians. His name was Major Robert Rogers, and he's very famous in North America because your rangers claim descent from him. He's also famous because he wrote down 28 rules for his soldiers, things like don't march so close together that one bullet can pass through two men, and if we get surprised and you get fall apart, we'll have an emergency rendezvous we can all meet up at. It's the basics of modern field craft. But what people forget is the thing he said after that. And he said, these are the 28 rules I want you to follow, but there are many, many circumstances that we cannot conceive a rule for. And in those circumstances, I want you to remember this, that you will preserve firmness and presence of mind on every occasion. That is the motto that we've adopted at my company for the leaders. I expect them to preserve firmness and presence of mind on every occasion. And we have found many, many occasions when that makes the difference. Something to ponder. And once you've, you've achieved your plan and you've launched your new, your, your new product to take the advantage from your opposition and you're patting yourselves on the back, it doesn't end there. They're really, really important. You, you must have a look at what went on because there'll be things that didn't go so well. Firstly, try and find out who was really good. And remember that the most adaptable members of your team may be invisible. The most adaptable member of your team may have seen a problem and solved it, and it, wasn't, it didn't become a big problem, so it goes unnoticed. Look for those small but important heroes and make sure you pat them on the back because you're rewarding success. And right at the beginning, I said success builds success. That's so, so important. As a team, get together. Okay, we've done all right. It's gone according to the plan. How have we, how have we done? What was good? What was bad? Learn from the experience. And then the most important thing is what you learn about your weaknesses, put them right. So when we do that as a team, I have one person in the office, and it's his job to ensure that we implement what we have learned from what's gone wrong. So I'm coming to the, I'm coming to the end, so bear with me. I want to share with you the, the most difficult situation for me in terms of adaptability because I want to prove that I actually do walk the talk. And um, this, this starts in 1984 with the IRA. The IRA placed a bomb in a hotel in Brighton well ahead of the party conference for the Conservative Party who were the government of the day, Margaret Thatcher's government. And they managed to detonate that bomb when the hotel was occupied, people died, people were seriously injured. Margaret Thatcher, the most remarkable leader, stepped out of the rubble into the glare of television cameras and stood there and said, we're not going to be cowed by this. This is only going to make us stronger. Remarkable leadership. The net result of that 
was a lot of soul searching was done and the police and the army set up something called the Police National Search Centre whose job is to search venues such as this or other things where, where conferences are taking place and to look for devices and so on. You understand the sort of thing. About 10 years ago, I was asked to give a lecture to them on the subject of visual tracking, where the tracking could be used for policing or for the army. And I delivered this lecture. And there were two net results of that. Firstly, the army came up to me and said, do you think this could be used for IEDs? And I said, yes, I think it can. We then tested the concept, found it worked. And without going into any detail, because it's still currently going on, we've had very good success using a very ancient skill, very low-tech skill, to defeat the bad guys. The other thing that happened was the police came out to me and they said, we think this has got really good potential in policing, but we'll need to prove it. And uh, if, if you ever see a situation developing you think you could help us with, let, will you let us know? And so I did. I went away and I didn't think anything would happen. Well, you know, there aren't, there aren't so many uh, manhunts in Britain. I think you're more used to that here than we are. Uh, we don't have many guns in, in, in Britain. But... Um, on the 1st of July 2010, this gentleman, Mr. Raoul Moat, was released from Durham Prison, harboring a massive grudge against the police. And um, he's, he's a fascinating individual. Two days later, he went to the house of his former girlfriend, who was terrified of him. And he hid outside and listened through the window. And she was talking to her boyfriend, and they were discussing him, not realizing he was outside. Her boyfriend, um, was a karate instructor, a very strong man. And she told Raumaut that he was a policeman. Raumaut hated the police because they'd arrested him so many times. And at two o'clock in the morning, he made himself known uh, to them. And uh, Chris Brown uh, stepped in front of his girlfriend and tried to protect her from Raumaut, who then shot him dead with a shotgun. He'd reloaded the shot with seven millimeter steel ball bearings. He then shot her. She was very seriously injured, shot in the liver and he fled the scene. Later that same day, 12.45, he walked up to a police car on normal traffic duty and shot PC David Rathband in the face with a shotgun, blinded him. In subsequent uh, years, he would commit suicide, no longer able to live with the injuries that he'd received. And um, the next time he was seen was the 5th of July, when he robbed a fish and chip shop. He was obviously hungry. And then he went into hiding. This became the largest manhunt in British history. A quarter of all our, our specialist firearms units, our SWAT teams, were, uh, were sent. And um, anyway, they found a campsite and he went missing. On the 8th of July, I was asked, will you go up and help? I got the phone call. Will you come and track him for me? So I found myself walking into a situation which was highly charged politically, where I'd have to engage with um, all of these organizations. Everybody wanted to catch him. And um, I was very lucky, and uh, we managed to flush him out. And a couple of days later, unfortunately, he shot himself. So um, it's an interesting story. I've kind of run out of time. I'd love to tell you more about it. But adaptability is it's not what you think. It's how you think that's important. And um, Try to look at some of those military commanders and see if you can find some useful lessons there. Thank you.